physics, and now he's in more applied nuclear physics. I uh, had the opportunity to meet Les almost 10 years ago on a very early version of the project he's going to talk to you about today. And a lot of progress has been made. It's very exciting work. So he's going to tell us about time correlated particle detection for the assessment of special nuclear material. Les, thank you. So um, it's really it's really a great pleasure to be here. Like, it's, like Rick said, I was an undergrad here. Um, so I'm a proud son of, of, of Berkeley Helson. In the meantime, when you did say in the meantime, I actually I graduated here in 1980. I wandered off and did other things for a while. Came back to uh, part of this is my first love. Um, in between, even I was even at, I was even at Stanford too um, in geophysics. Um, but you, you need to worry. All my allegiances are always with with Berkeley. <laughs> um, I grew up in El Cerrito, which is you know next town over. Of course, my father worked at LBL. Uh, a lot of my friends were their, their parents were professors here at Berkeley. As it turns out, I didn't actually know it at the time. But as I came here and started working, I also I worked at LBL myself, which is an undergrad. I came back and wrote my thesis. I did it in you know, 92. I was in Berkeley writing my thesis here too. So, so I'm really glad to be back. It's really, really a pleasure for me. Um, so, um, so, like, so, so, so uh, what I want to tell you about is, is it actually represents um, years of, of our group's work. It's not all my work, of course. Um, relatively little of it is my actual hands on work, which is sort of the way things go. But what we're doing here is we're is we use these correlated uh, particle measurements to tell us about the material. We're, we're, we're not, we care about, about the material. And so it turns out that um, the production of, uh, of correlated neutrons in particular are, are relatively rare. Um, the neutron production itself is rare. There's not, there's not that many neutron sources, though there are neutrons in background. There are actually almost all the neutrons in background are coming from cosmic ray production, actually. The cosmic ray production other than fission is only is one of the few natural ways there are to produce correlated neutrons, which is why it's a really good signature. Plus nuclear material, the, the, the interesting thing about nuclear material is that neutron interactions occur in them. Uh, particularly the one that's most interesting is that the, the, the neutrons will induce fission in material and they'll make more neutrons. And so the, the material itself is a source of producing uh, correlated uh, material. So, I'll start, this is my first slide that I made when I was first at Livermore. From this slide, you can find out a lot of things about me personally. One is that I'm very challenged in making slides. I can't make cheap whiz bang slides. I also kind of think kind of linearly. Um, it's simple for me to think that way. I can only understand simple things, which is actually one of the things I'm good at. I understand. I make things simple because I can't understand them. But again, we're, we're interested in nuclear material. We're interested in measuring it, quantifying it. Um, Sometimes detection, a lot of our, we haven't worked so much uh, purely on detection itself, detection. So I think of measuring material on a continuum, so I draw on a line here. I think that, you know, on one hand, if you're looking just for something that looks weird, like you might just see if you saw a neutron, a neutron source in, in an unknown object, that might be weird enough for you to be interested in it, because it's not too common to have neutron sources. Um, so looking for something out of place is all you're interested in. If you're interested on the other end and you're interested in diagnosing it, either um, for safeguards, where, where people want to be able to know that they have a certain material, the right what kind of material it is, they need to know everything about it. They would like to measure it in a, in a way that tells them the most about it that they can. Um, and also, which is one of my, so I wear two major hats a little more that I work with kind of problems. One is I'm interested in what I, what I call the black box problem that somebody comes across something, they suspect that it's a, a problem, and it seems to be radioactive, and now they're wondering, is this, could this be a nuclear weapon, or is it uh, maybe just a dispersal device? I mean, what is it? So you don't know what it is. You're, you're, you're presented with something. You'd like to know what it is. Uh, you'd like to know anything you could find, but you don't know anything about it at all. That's one of my problems. I call that the emergency response problem. The other one is in the middle here, which is a treaty verification problem, which is an interesting problem, because um, in some ways, you would like to know that when you're verifying a treaty, that that thing is a warhead. If you were saying it's supposed to be one, you'd like to be able to say that it was. Um, the other issue thing, though, is that, especially in the US, if you took one of our weapons that we said we were taking apart, we don't want you to know everything there is to know about it, because then you would know how to make this weapon. And so there's an information problem. So you're always sort of in the middle where you'd like to have enough information, whatever that is, it's left to be defined. Um, but you're not really not going to be allowed to know everything there is to know about it. Um, maybe someday, so we'll so, okay, so um, I also need to put up, there's a, this work, represents the work of a lot of people. Um, Mark Rowland stands up there, he's no longer at Livermore, he's left Livermore now. 
but um, he's actually the origin for most of how we got involved in this work. All the people that were working here got involved were because of Mark. Uh, Mark was the original person who was interested in using neutron correlations for, for measuring nuclear material. Um, the other people up on top, this next line, the Nedge Prasad, Neil Snyder, and James Wong, they actually, James is a coder, but they actually are the origin of a lot of the code that we use, and they're, Neil and Minosha are theorists, or part of the theorists, um, as, as Rick said, I, I'm actually, a, my first love was, was, was in, actually my first love was with really archaeology, that I didn't go there. Um, my second love was, was particle physics, and I always sort of drift back and think about it a lot, um, but those two guys in the front there are, are actually part of the theorists, and there's a good reason why we use them. I'll explain that a little bit too. So some of the methods we use are, are originating um, from math that is very, that is very useful in quantum physics too. Um, the other people are, just, are, are so they're all almost all these other people are all physicists um, working a little more, and uh, so they, they contribute to a lot of this in, in detail. But, and I'll try and point them out and take one of the things that come up. But um, so since I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence at first, but I like to remind people of a few things about measuring. Um, if you if you never you know. All of you by now probably have seen detectors of some sort. Um, just walking through an airport, and you've seen detectors. And if you've seen a vast data detector there, you've seen it. But I'll remind you that um, there are parts, when, when, we, when we measure stuff for radiation detection, the first thing we need to know is that you always see the neutral particles because the charged ones that are produced out of material are always blocked. Um, almost always because almost any material, if it's, even if it's a source, is contained in something. And usually that amount of containment is enough to stop the charge particles from escaping, so you never see them. So you only see gamma rays, maybe maybe, um, maybe um, X-rays. You see gamma rays coming off, maybe and yeah, neutrons. That's not what you can see. So the other thing that I'll tell you, the second thing is, so if you've only seen, you know, small check sources, which you might have seen in the lab, uh, you might be able to tell from the counts of gamma rays coming off it how strong it is. You want to measure, say, the dose is something, the number of counts per second is something. It's related often to the math, the volume that's there. Material. Well, if you have a lot of nuclear material, like kilograms of material, um, especially uranium, plutonium, those they're metal, they're very dense, and they're self-shielding. They're extremely self-shielding. So, if you have a metallic piece of, of plutonium, which is emitting huge numbers of gamma rays, they're only coming off the surface. The only the penetration is only about a millimeter or so. But the, gamma, but the characters of gamma rays you can see coming off them are actually coming in the middle. And you don't see them. So, to me, especially to me, someone like me. When I see gamma rays, I know they're only giving me the area. They're not, they're not telling me about the volume. So the only thing that tells me about the volume, which is another reason why we like neutrons, is the neutrons. Because the average neutron scattering length in metal is a, is a, um, is a few inches, actually, in the iron. And plutonium is a little less, but it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot, of, it's a lot, it's a far distance. And so those neutrons are, ten, and that's a scattering length. They tend to escape. Um, so, and there's other ways that they can capture things like that, but they, they, they tend to escape. And I also went on there just for the heck of it that neutrons do have a finite lifetime. Um, so they only, they, only, they only exist for about 15 minutes or so. Um, then they decay, they may decay in the proton, electron. But um, so if you see neutrons bouncing around, they were, they came recently. They, were, they weren't there for a while. Okay. Here's a periodic table thing. This is a, a severe plot. This plot is not an old periodic table. It's plotted Z versus A. The only reason why I do this is I'll give you the hint too. So um, the stable elements run along a curve, so they don't go linear. So the stable elements have roughly an equal number of neutrons and protons, the light elements. As you go heavy, go up to the transuranics, that ratio goes almost to two. It's like one and three quarters to one. So what that tells you is, and it's sort of a continuum, is that if you break apart um, a very heavy atom like uranium and plutonium and bust it into two like it does with fissioning, you end up with two pieces that are neutron heavy. And so what they do, what it does is it tries to get rid of them. It, it wants to go to a stable element, so it starts throwing them off, and then eventually starts being decay too. But it'll do that very rapidly. But that's why it's giving off some extra neutrons. And it's that fact that these neutrons are going in this fission. And those neutrons that go along and cause another one that causes a chain reaction, that's the interesting thing about the material. So that's the, that's the only reason why I, I thought I'd show you that. And from there, we oh, here's a little cross section. It's probably a bad cross section, and you can't actually read it. Uh, this is blue here, the dark blue. That's the fission cross section. That's the fission cross section. So the, so the interesting thing about uranium, particularly U235, this is actually a this is U235 plot here. U233 does this, plutonium 239 does this. Um, 
the cross-section for fission, which is that blue thing, it actually increases as the energy goes down. That's a little bit rare. That's why you can sustain fission chains in those materials. That's why they are useful in reactors, because you can get them down to low energy and they have a much higher quality of causing fission. The other thing that's and if you look at something like U238, which does not sustain vision chains very well, it actually has a high energy uh, vision cross section, but it falls off around an MEV. And it doesn't reduce vision anymore. And when low energy, it captures, actually, in beta decay. That's actually, that's actually how you make the tonnage. If you have U238 and you put, you put in a reactor and you put neutrons on it, that's actually how you make the tonnage. It just captures once beta decay, so you got the tonnage. Okay, but that's, a, that's the characteristic of the material that we're interested in, is that it keeps fissioning as it, it gets higher and higher probability of fission as it goes on. The other thing that's um, true about neutron interactions as opposed to gamma ray ones is that almost all neutron interactions are the high cross sections are, are resonances. And so a lot of your intuition that's driven by imagining being used to gamma ray for uh, more and more material causes more, well, that's in general more is true, but um, you have an, it has sort of a continuous uh, characteristic of how you absorb gamma rays. Neutrons get absorbed at once. They don't, they don't, so when you track them, you have to track them. This is this is an aside. You have to track them individually. You can't do them on averages very well, unless you're doing something like a reactor where it's, it's just a pure numbers. Okay, so this is a, a quick outline of what I'm talking about here. So I'll start showing you um, some data. I'm going to go. I'm going to go back and tell you how you measure. So, so this is another silly throwaway slide that I made, kindergarten slide that reminds what fission is. So here's a heavy element. It breaks into two parts. Two parts. It's neutron heavy, spills a couple of neutrons. So in the case of plutonium, that number is like 2.2 per, per spontaneous fission. This is californium. That's a really heavy guy. Um, there's up to, the average is almost four. It's like 3.8. Um, this distribution of plutonium really goes from zero to about five or six at the most. Um, uh, californium actually goes out to about eight or nine. But they also give seven, eight, I have seven, eight there, seven to 10 gamma rays. They're also given off of vision. They're high energy gamma rays. Um, that's because once it, starts, once it gets tired of kicking out um, neutrons, it starts kicking out photons. It starts beta decay. So these are these are the prompt guys too. There's actually some beta delay guys that come off. Of okay, so this is another slide that I like to show people to remind them that there's there's different kinds of things that spontaneous. Here's a bunch of common things that spontaneously fission um, and the rates that they are. So it turns out plutonium is a very prodigious neutron source. Um, most of it's coming in plutonium from 240 P240. P240 is an easy number to remember, so I can only remember like three things. So um, plutonium 240 gets off about 1,000 neutrons per gram per second. Okay, and so that means a gram of, I mean a kilogram of weapons grade plutonium, which is um, about 6%, so it's about 60 grams of, of uh, 240 in it, is about 6, 10, and 4 neutron source. That's pretty good. Uranium is a neutron source too, but it's a much weaker one. So uranium, most of the, most of the neutrons coming from uranium are coming from U238. U238 gives up about 13.6 neutrons per second per kilogram. Per gram per kilogram. So there's only like 14 per kilogram of depleted uranium. It's highly enriched. So no number to remember, it's about one. So it turns out a neutron per second per kilogram is given off for a kilogram. Of, so you know, 60 kilograms, which is the critical mass of, of highly enriched uranium, um, only gives us 60 neutrons per second. And most of it's actually from the U38. It's more than the U38. So if you enrich it higher than that, it's all less. Or if it's lower, it's more. But so when we look at stuff, we go, hey, big sources, small sources. There's uranium. So if we're looking at neutrons, plutonium things are easy to see. Uranium things are not so easy to see. OK, so here's now on the little side one. So this is a neutron. Pardon me? Plutonium 238. Oh, 238, yes. 238 is we also. Don't have much of it, there's not much of it. 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 There's not much of um, people make you, you have to make PU-238. If you do it in normal reactions, you get a fair amount, but not a huge amount. Um, in order to get lots of it, you actually have to stock it with, uh, with Neptunium to make PU-238. And that's how they make those, you know, those, those uh, heat sources they use in satellites and stuff that they use Neptunium. 
So this is um, this is just reminded of to tell you about how we when we quantify this where this came from. So these these came from during World War II. So this is these are if you those of you who are working on here, it's very popular for people to have you read the Feynman lecture notes. So Richard Feynman, of course, is very famous. This is reading the Feynman lecture notes is about the worst way you can learn introductory physics. You know, I can say that for sure. Um, um, it's true. One of the guys who saw that list actually was one of um, George Chaplin, one of Feynman's uh, grad students originally when he wrote the text. And he's actually in the, he's in the credits in there. But Feynman was, uh, he was young in the world. Jim Wolf, he was in his 20s, early 20s. And he was actually head of the uh, physics group at theory group at Los Alamos. Yeah, he was 25. But of course, he was one of the great physicists of, uh, of uh, the 20th century. He, his original problem was uh, they were building a reactor. They just wanted to know when it was going critical. How do you know as you approach critical? How do you how do you know? Uh, you see the flux goes up, of course. But you know how would you quantify? How do you know how close you're getting? Um, and so he came up with this very simple idea. Now his original idea is that top line here that you can't really read, but that Los Alamos report it's actually still classified as it turns out. Um, it's uh, pretty long. It's a hundred something pages. It's a beautiful paper. If you ever get a chance of reading it. Because uh, it's, it's typical climate, it's, it's crystal clear. It's, it's, and the reason why it's classified, uh, I can just tell you, is that it has some ideas that are not classified. It has, uh, but he does, he's thinking all the time, he starts telling you how you can figure out when you're going to make a bond out of this. Is when, the, when you reach what they call the uh, probability initiation. And so that became, uh, that's actually still what it turns out. But this is a beautiful paper um, that he wrote. But his whole idea was just that, well, if you look at a random source and you decide to make a measurement, measure for a finite period of time, and just keep repeating that method, say how many neutrons do I see, how many counts do I see this whole time, and you plot it based on that count rate and how wide that bit is that you're measuring, um, you can predict the distribution if it was random. You, it's an easy thing to do to predict what you think you expect to see the random counts. And if you see a higher correlation level than that, and if you, or specifically you just count it as variance, which you know, most of these statistics know how to count variance, We'll see that there's a it's broader, and based on that broadness, will tell you how correlated the signal is. And so he worked on this. That was his original idea. Now, an interesting aside, and this is they're all powerful physicists like me. This is interesting. It turns out there's this this middle thing here is a paper by Schrödinger. If he's ever taken an atmosphere Schrodinger. Schrödinger, he he was he's an Austrian. He was actually um, not in Germany or Austria during World War II. He was in Ireland. So it turns out he. Uh, he has an interesting history, but he was in semi-exile in Ireland, uh, which he actually he lived in and uh, worked in Ireland for many years. Um, but he was just there. It turns out he wrote this other paper, which actually talks about how to do this. This paper is very difficult to read, which is typical Schrodinger. It has a lot of math in it. Um, but it's actually the same stuff that I'm in the And interestingly, here's a couple other papers here which you can't read either. These are references from Dirac. Um, turns out, Dirac was in England. It, he's, he's British. He was in he, later years. He actually took Florida State. Strangely, don't know why. Maybe he liked to settle or something. But um, he was in England, and originally Oppenheimer wanted—I mean, uh, others wanted to know if, they, if the British had sent people to the Manhattan Project in, in uh, Mexico, and uh, they were asked if they wanted Dirac to come to Los Alamos to work on the Manhattan Project. And Oppenheimer said, "No, no, I, I wanted to stay." In and so. One of our theorists, Neil Simon, has, has actually looked into this, and we're actually certain that Dirac was given a commission to go think about this problem. Too. And it's true, it's known that he went to go see Schrodinger in Ireland during the war in 1942, and set him off to think about this problem. So this is the origin of this, of, of this is actually done. So Schrodinger was used as a check for Feynman's original you know, inspiration. So as brilliant as Feynman was, Oppenheimer didn't trust him. <laughs> So that's another, that's another lesson, right? Anybody can be checked. <laughs> um, the interesting thing for me, me as a particle physicist, so I'll show you a little bit more of this later. Um, so these are actually references. These are some other references that are here. These are also um, references from guys I've been working with here. We've actually extended this, this problem a little bit. Uh, we added a lot of time dependence into this problem, which allows us to predict what we think the distributions are going to look like as we measure them, which is actually very important. Um, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit how this works. Um, I, I thought about trying to just write the math. I said that was boring. And I, would, you know, I was the wrong person to do that explanation too. But here's the original problem. So 
This is actually found by them. So this is the original mathematical process that was used to do this. This is a branching process. It's called the Dalton Walston Watson project uh, branching process. So this is the, this is the 1870s when this was actually done. Um, this original problem, strangely, was these mathematicians who did this. They were interested in the extinction of family names. Kind of weird, but it was really important to British guys how whether their lords how long their families would last, or you know, and maybe they could tell them what was the optimal number of children to have, or something to have the sons to continue the line. Um, we don't know, but they they originally uh, had this idea of calculating probability density function. Um, these days, that is using all kinds of things. These computers, of course, can calculate these things very easily. Back in the 1850s, when you had to write down a piece of paper. Some of this theory wasn't so useful on uh, calculus, but they were interested. So they, they would do this branch and say, well, okay, you have, a, you have an heir, and he's got a couple sons or something, and what's the probability if he has like zero to three sons, and there's a probability that he lives you know, to reproduce, what's the probability that his line will, ex will extinguish? Well, he won't have this family name. They have to bring in somebody else or something like that. You know, so that's where this math came from. For some reason, Feynman knew this and found this and applied it to fission chains. Um, and it turns out that, that this is a very interesting math that is used all the time. Um, for me, again, as a part of physicist, it's obvious to us who look at this and look at this map that this is how Feynman actually understood how to do his scattering process that he won the Nobel Prize for. He would, you know, it's called quantum dynamics, where he calculates these things by um, doing these loops of, of, in the case of ENM, loops of uh, photon interaction. Uh, using infinite number of possible interactions. It's the same math as this. So it's very obvious to us that when he went on after the war, that's when he took the work he did during the war and applied the same math to do. Uh, what a noble prize book. Pretty good. Okay, so the other thing I see here, um, we should get on with this anyway, so um, is that we're measuring fission chains. So fission chains themselves are almost instantaneous. And the time of a fast chain, if you have a lot of metal, is a few nanoseconds, it's time the neutrons take to transit around the material. If you've got a moderating reflector or you have a reactor, that time can be very long because it might be a very long moderation time um, that's involved, you know, making things come back faster on fission form. Um, most of the detectors that we're using, like helium-3 detectors, which you might have been taught, taught um, are thermal detectors. So it requires that the, that the neutrons are thermalized or take advantage of the high cross-section of, of the capture cross-section. So the detector work. So that time scale that you actually see the correlations on is, is on that time scale, the time scale of the detector. The original time scale is actually much faster than that. It's now in nanoseconds. And so there's a, you know, you've lost a factor of 10,000, 100,000 in time. So I'll show you some data where we, we're using thermals data. I'll show you others that's fast and what's the advantage of it. If I'm lucky, I'll get this done before if you want. Um, and uh, it'll make some sense to you. So anyway, how do you do this? There's several ways you can actually measure the correlation. Um, you can see this a time series. You know, just see when time the log events. When do they come? You can put a gate, uh, a gate on it. Um, there's two ways to do this. You can put a triggered gate easily on every single event that comes in and see what follows it and sort of find amount of time. Or you can just slap a random time gate on your string and just see. Now it turns out a lot of the original theory was based on random time gates because that theory is easy, e much easier to calculate. Triggering is a little harder. Um, but our guys are actually smart enough to figure that out to do that too. Uh, the weird thing is, is the errors, the, the correlated errors in this theory is, are harder to calculate, and they're easier to calculate than trigger data for whatever reason. Okay, so this is just an example of what that means. So it means, like I said, every time you open up a gate of a finite length, you see what it you see what it is. Okay, so. Here's an example of a, of a counter. Here's a well counter. This has got a whole lot of helium-3 tubes in it and a bunch of polyethylene plastic as a moderator. If you, if you arrange them right, which this one's arranged pretty optimally, there's, I think there's like 50 something tubes in here or something like that. Um, it's about 50% efficient, meaning that if you produce a whole bunch of fission energy neutrons in there, you'll get half of the counter. The other half gets captured in the poly. Okay, so that's about as good as you can do. So you have an amyline source, which is a purely random source. And you just plot now, like I said, I opened up a gate. This gate happens to be 512 microseconds, whatever it's worth. I don't remember even what the count rate was. It doesn't really matter. But if you plot that and say, well, how many times did I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 23, 29, whatever neutrons here, what's the distribution of the plot? You plot it, 
So in this, in all the data, I'll show you the blue, or it's always data. This red is what that distribution looked like. If it was random, this is easily predict from theoretical prediction. And it turns out, of course, they map perfectly because it is random. So, okay. So let's, this is a correlated source. So this is California in that 50% model counter. And as you see, the data lies on this blue line. It's, it's, it's um, variance, it's width, it's much wider than what's predicted by that. So these things are, are correlated. Of course, this is strongly correlated. And the other thing I should mention, this is a log plot. This is a log of counts. And so if you're not used to looking at log plots in the blue, where the area between these curves are the same. You can all look at some of it because it's a log curve. Um, but that is a limit. So we call, I call this visual, visualizing vision. So if you're looking for a vision source and you see, you make this kind of plot, and you look and see what the distribution really looks like, you measure versus what it is, and it doesn't look like it's random, you, you think it's correlated. It's correlated. Okay, so here's a plutonium ball. It's, it was a couple kilograms. Its multiplication was about two here. Um, and you can see again in this well counter, it's very non random. It's very strongly correlated. And you can also see that we're able to predict this from a theoretical prediction pretty easily. The theoretical prediction that we're using here, though, is, a, is an abstraction. It's not, it's just imagining that you have a source, you have a multiplying material. You know what the average new bar is roughly for those things. And uh, you, you put in, a, you either measure or put in an efficiency that you're measuring and say, well, what did I expect? Uh, and it also has, well, in this case, it has a time dependence to it too, which we actually matched it to what we, what we thought it was. Um, there's, you can measure that too. That's actually kind of important, as it turns out. Because you know, this is, cause if you didn't have the time dependence, you wouldn't know, given the bin width, exact width of distribution you should be measuring. Yeah. OK. so. This is now a weak source. This is only 10 grams of P oxide, which has um, 0.6 grams or so of P240 in it, which means it's a 600 neutrons per second source. It's pretty weak, but it's still strongly correlated in this well count, because the well counter is really efficient. Well, all the problems that I described to you earlier that we're, we're interested in, uh, except for the safeguards one, we can't put stuff inside the well counter. To see. So we can't build that kind of a detector and use it to tell us what's going on. So we tend to use portable detectors. And so here's just an example of some. So these are portable, but they're really only like portable to the one really strong guy in our group, because he seems weigh like 90 pounds. And so there's one guy in our group, um, they're all he's very strong, and he doesn't find it hard to pick these things up. Um, yeah, for me, that's a lot harder to do. Um, but it is portable. And, and so, you know, um, and there's, you know, this is a commercial vision, you know, a little more actually licensed over tech, but there's other detectors you can get. But these are all, um, Coincidence kind of detectors too, they're not just simply um, single counters. So a low efficiency detector, you know, could be anywhere from a percent or so to in this case this is measured at five percent, which is actually fairly good for a portable detector. Um, the most neutrons are it's easy from the leak out of whatever holes you have in your system. So this is that same PU ball I showed you before, um, but you can see it's still strongly correlated. You know, we measure it with this detector. Um, this is eight months, it's eight and a half minutes worth of data that we took. But you can still see it's very strongly correlated. There's no, not very many problems there. Uh, this is California now. And you can see it's still correlated, but it's you can't see it very easily. And that's because the efficiency is, is low. And this is efficiency here is a couple percent. Um, it's not unusual to go down about a percent or so efficiency of the detector, the portable detector. Uh, so it's much harder. This is also 15 hours worth of data if you actually have everything up there. And if you actually have 10 minutes, you have to cut off the plot right there. And so your eye doesn't see it very well. But you know, mathematically you can tell. It's, it's, again, this is a log plot. It's significant detail. It's uh, but it turns out, it turns out though, I'll just say this too, this is not a classified statement. But an interesting thing is, California, which has, like I said, it has a new bar that's around 3.7, 3.8. It's the average number of neutrons per vision is like that. It looks a lot like lowly multiplying plutonium, as it turns out. If you have a shell of plutonium that multiplies only like 1.7 or so, and that new bar is a lot lower, it turns out they don't look that different. And with a low efficiency, it's not, it's not easy to tell at all. The difference between the two. With a higher efficiency detector, it's pretty easy to tell. But that's just an aside. Okay, so the other thing that we do, like I said, we, we look at the time dependence. So here, uh, there's a lot of ways you can do this. We, we're measuring a moment here, um, a calculated moment. Um, this is our Feynman's original way, too. And we just actually, what we're doing here, instead of having, doing one thing, we change the bit. We just, it is showing you what the correlation rate is as we change that bin from some very short times to longer times. 
This went from one microsecond up to 512 microseconds. So we plotted that, and here we're showing you actually California is not moderated. And since it's not moderated, this, this, this time dependence looks exactly like our, our known detector time dependence. So if we're looking at an unknown object, and using safeguards, you have to worry about this because we're not doing moderated. But if we're looking at something unknown, we care whether it's moderated or not. One of the main reasons why we care is, of course, is that um, in this emergency response problem, where I'm wondering whether someone actually has a nuclear device someplace, the first thing that I care about after I decide that there's nuclear material there is I'm going to start wondering if there's high explosives there. Because generally, if you have material and there's no high explosives there, it's not a lot. I don't have to worry about it. I, I could, it becomes a screwdriver problem there. I could take it somewhere to get apart. It's, it's a threat problem when it has high explosives. The next thing I worry about is whether it does. And so this is a way to tell that. Because this guy here has had, had three inches of poly, which is a moderator, around a large kilogram of ball, but that time dependence, which is the way it is here in data, doesn't depend on what the detector was. And so we know there's a moderator there. And we, we actually have a loose way to tell roughly, um, we have estimates of even just looking at the time dependence, what we think the amount of moderator is now. Um, it turns out all HE has hydrogen in it. You can't make high explosives without hydrogen in it. You can, you can have other different kinds of materials in there hydrogen you have to have it. And so um, it's always going to moderate if there's anything out of it. Okay, so here's a resource now. This is actually uranium. Um, people use these correlation techniques for a long time. Ellis Alamos to do a material accountability there. That well counter design is actually Ellis Alamos' design. Um, there's a big lore that, so a lot of people say uranium doesn't give up neutrons at all. I, I told you it does, it's just weak. Um, people didn't use these correlation techniques on uranium. Um, we started doing this uh, 15 years ago, and I, I think I know why, actually, why that people didn't do it. Um, but the reason is you look at this distribution, it looks like an other distribution is falling. Like, this is actually a couple kilograms, I mean, it's 20 kilograms of uranium. It multiplies by 2 ish or so, 2.1, 2.5, something like that. Um, but it's got this distribution, but it looks weird, too, because it looks like a falling distribution. It's got this black thing on it. And so you go, well, what the hell? You know, it's, it doesn't look physical. Was it, was it, were the detectors working right? Well, it turns out they were. Um, this flat thing, this is a cosmic ray induced events, as it turns out. So this, this measurement was done in a facility at Livermore. It didn't have much overburden on it. So the cosmic nucleons, which is actually what's causing it, not neurons, it's nucleons, that are coming in and whacking our material. We had just the main storm, it was whacking. And so that's a high nucleon. It makes a big vision event, big swath. And so it gives you that big, big whack on there. And so that's actually what that is. And so this is really not just one distribution, it's several distributions lying on top of each other. Turns out too that the count rate going on here, uh, I, I guess I split it. Yes, in this case, um, we were getting about uh, six counts per second here total, and four of them were background, as it turns out. It was causally induced background hitting our detector. Now, they hit our neutral, they, they can cause vision in it too, but most of the counts weren't even coming from our object we were interested. So my belief is the reason why people didn't do this originally was because there were old Salamos, and Salamos is at 7,000 feet. There's a lot higher than the background count. The background of Livermore, like I say here, is a, it's like four counts per second. Old Salamos is like 20. And so their real signal is being buried underneath the random signal that they didn't know how to remove. And so they didn't, they, they didn't know how to quantify things. Well, it turns out we know how to do it pretty easily because that random signal, because most of the random, even though there are correlated events, it's mostly, it's mostly random on a short time scale. Um, we can just remove it. We know what that distribution looks like. So we just figure out what it is get rid of. Okay, so here again, I'm talking about quantifying. So you can actually get a numerical quantification by strictly using moments. Um, it, it turns out there's a, there's a, there's a if, you, if you calculate the final, it's a normalized moment, and you do a ratio of, of, of the second and third moment, you can actually look at an asymptotic value of that distribution and get a number off. If you know, if you know certain things, you know the efficiency, or if you measure it. Um, that's fine if you have a system with only one thing. But the system I just last told you about, it doesn't have one thing going on. It's got several things going on at once. Uh, you can't solve that with a moment because there's not one moment to problem. You have to guess what the other moments were. So what we try and do a little more, and that's how we had the theorists go out and calculate, we try and predict what we think is the most recent one. We try and pick what we think is the most likely one that matches what we have. And from that, we have to know that. So why is it you can do that? So this is just a plot showing you how we do this, and we predict it. 
Um, so this is what I just said. We actually try and, and, and predict what we're doing here. At the time when I first made this slide a while ago, this is a few years ago, uh, we had finished this and we had just started working on, uh, we'd done thermal physics, we had just started working on doing it fast, with the really fast neutron defense, it's original dependence. And that's all done now. We also put in the gamma rays too, so we can take a look at the gamma rays. Gamma rays are not so useful, again, partly because when you have a big blob, you're shielding internally a lot of the gamma rays that are coming off. Some of them are not occurring on the surface, and so you start losing them. And so they're not the best thing to use. Um, and that's why in the end, we always like to go back to neutrons, because neutrons are always the nicest pattern. Okay, so, like I said, why, you know, the next question, which, which I'm trying to address next couple of slides, and you won't really get it exactly, but I'll maybe be left a little bit, is, you know, why does this method work at all? You know, if you have a 1% or something, a 1% efficient detector, and you're looking for Paris correlation of 1%, and you're only going to see only 1 in 10,000 of the, of the times that they're correlated at all. And why do you see multiples at all? Um, it seems like you go in powers, if you're looking for um, two or three neutrons or more, like a session, it's just recently have like up to five, ten neutrons in it. How do you, why do you see five or ten neutrons at all? You shouldn't even ever see that many, you would think. Well, it, it, it's true, the common choice of how many per efficiency detector is right, but what your intuition has not shown you is that this stuff multiplies. And so that's part of what I'm going to show you here. So, here, here I just, this is just the probability. So this is, if, if you had, um, just we're producing some number of neutrons, and so um, this is a multiplication of two and a half, like that uranium shell is showing you. What's the average number of neutrons you'd expect? So the average number of neutrons you'd expect to see per that uranium visioning with, uh, a new, uh, with, the, with the multiplication of two and a half is like nearly four, and that's four right there. And, but it has this incredibly long tail. So the peak is up here, you know, at 3.8, 3 and 4, but sometimes there's 100 neutrons produced, but it's, you know, only happening one in a million times. But there's a whole, you know, but one in a thousand times you're getting 20 neutrons. So it turns out that's the most probable thing to do. So if you wanted to ask, you know, when can you see five neutrons, it turns out on this curve it shows you that the most probable time to see five neutrons, if you see this 4%, is to, is to actually have like 40 produced to see five not C5 on 5, the, the more frequent times that it's produced, but seeing it the rarer times when 40 is produced, you have a shot at C5. And that's actually what you believe would happen. So here's a bunch of combinatorics, it doesn't really matter, but you can believe it. I think, I think theorists do, I didn't do this, theorists did it, it was done right. So, so the probability that you would see five neutrons on the 4% efficient detector with uh, you know, N2 and a half is actually, um, and actually if you fold in the time, you actually will see it three and a half times in 10 minutes. And if you actually calculated the random probability of seeing that, it's only 1 in 10 minus 15. So you never see it. You never see it. But just because, like I said, there's, there's these weird little small probabilities you actually produce a lot. OK, so now we move on. Hopefully I'll get through this. Um, so this is a lead pile. It's a pile of lead. So the reason why I made this pile of lead is we went, well, we'll just take some uranium and see if we can make it disappear. Put inside this lead, so it's that lead is. It's, there's, those are two inch bricks, so these are actually like four inches on the side. So that's like eight inches of lead or something. And we stuck the we stuck the uranium in there. We couldn't see any of the lines coming out, uh, with, with exception of the, of, of the 2.6 and the 232. But that's okay. The primary 25 lines are all gone. The 2 8 lines are all gone, and we measured the, the the neutrons. So we did this, and we saw a huge number of correlated neutrons coming out this lead pile. And then, I didn't, this is actually that alone, as it turns out. And we go, boy, that looks a lot like uranium. That's kind of weird. So this is just nucleons whacking lead. So when it whacks the lead, it does NX ending. So it, it whacks the neutrons out of lead. Turns out then it actually makes pions. Those pions even make more, spill more. So it's, it's actually kind of like multiplication. Um, and it turns out we, we put the uranium in there, the count rate changes very slightly because this is actually a pretty high count rate, but we couldn't tell whether it was in there or not. And actually, I gave this pure lead thing to our to Manoj Prasad, our theorist, who knew the most about this analysis. And he scratched his head and sat there and he was moaning. He would, you know, if you know Manoj, he whines sometimes, but he, he was going, Oh, you know, I don't it's like, but you know, I'm really sure there's uranium, it's so so correlated. I, I can't get a good reasonable number, but it's it's confusing. But there must be something in there. Maybe there were several pieces of uranium in there. No, it was just lead. So we actually made this 
uranium disappeared. We didn't know how to measure this. So now comes our fast detectors. So we actually had some fast detectors for a different project. So these are a liquid scintillator. And uh, still being, which is a crystal is actually better. It's just expensive and, and people aren't making it right now. Um, but this stuff here was xylene. And everybody hates xylene because it's flammable and toxic, you know, two bad things. Um, but, you know, lab guys don't care. Um, there's, there's a new scintillator that is, uh, liquid scintillator is actually uh, mineral oil, which is much easier to use, but it's not as good. There's plastics now that have been developed a little more you can use for this too. But the key is that they work on uh, neutron recoil. The neutron is the proton, and then if you know the proton recoils, you see that. So you're really seeing about half the energy. That's the drawback of it for one. Um, and for two, the other thing is, it's, it, which is a feature, is that it's sensitive to gamma rays. So it's good in some cases, and bad in others, because the gamma rays screw you in the end because they struggle. If, oh, the way you tell, of course, you probably know this, is that you look at the, 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 the states that are excited in the, in the in the plastic or in the xylene are the ground state is excited for neutrons and they tend to live longer. So the light is a little bit longer. And the way you lose this correlation, of course, is the second gamma ray comes in at the end and it looks like the balance is off. And that's what screws you in the end if you have too many too high color. Anyway, so you do this. So this is a different plot. This is now plotting the time between arrivals of what we thought were what we call neutrons in our detector. The upper plot is just lead only. And you see this up here, this hash up here, which is happening at some count. This is the random count rate. Again, this is a log plot of the time between when neutrons are coming at you when you measure them. So here's the random count rate. And you see these correlated guys, in the case of lead, um, only at a very short time scale. That's the time of flight from the source of the detector. But the, it, it, it happens only, you know, because what happens is neutrons come in, they lock these neutrons, they either come and lock your detector or they leave. They escape the system. Um, they might bounce around the lead a little bit longer, but when they do that, they start losing their energy after a while. And then some of these are threshold detectors. They only can only see something at the end of the year or so. You eventually can't see them, which is, which is a feature. So you only see the really fast ones. And so here you see them. It's only seen with a particular time scale. When we put the uranium in there, lo and behold, all of a sudden we start seeing events coming in an intermediate time scale. And what that is is it's now the neutrons are bouncing around. They're down below threshold. They can't see them anymore in the detector. So the low energy guys, I showed you the cross section, reducing fission, it's higher as the energy goes down. So the low energy neutron can cause a fission new material did here. Now suddenly there's a fission, fast neutrons are appearing again, and so fast neutrons are coming out of nowhere. And so that's what this is. So here we could tell unequivocally that there was uranium in here. And we knew it was uranium because it was plutonium, we would have seen it earlier. But so we're sure that's uranium now. And I mean enriched uranium, not just depleted uranium and natural uranium. So that was now that we did this when Rick was still at Livermore originally. Rick had seen this a long time ago. So this is what set us off on our on our, 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 our new thing where we started getting very, very interested in using the cylinder because we could see events. So this is actually data. So this is a, the time, this is just running time here on the x-axis. And this is just counts. We just saw counts. In this case, um, the purple guys are gamma rays and the, and the gold guys are neutrons. I always plot neutrons that way, so I like to think that neutrons are gold, and that's my own joke. That all the guys might follow this. Um, but what you see, this is what you see in fission. You actually see some random counts coming in, and also you see a spray, a large number of correlated things. So that's a fission. And you can tell by, by so now this lower plot I just blown up this time. So this is only 140 nanoseconds of time. And what we saw here now in succession is a couple gamma rays and some neutrons and gamma rays again. So this right here is probably one fission. We happen, to, or we happen to see a bunch of guys popping in at once. We happen to get a lot of them, so we see a couple of gammas. And gammas are going to see they're faster than neutrons, so they always precede the neutrons from the same event. So you stack one fission. That gamma ray is probably from another fission. We just didn't see the neutrons from it. Here's another one. Here's another one here. We just saw the neutron. And again, we know this because this time is so short compared to the random count that there's no probability that, that these guys were not correlated with each other. And um, there also it turns out there could be normal scattering, it turns out too, um, but that's not true in this case, but we can tell that too um, to some degree. But anyway, um, here's another case. Here's a, here's a, ne here's a neutron, uh, here's a fission, here's another one here, here's another one. Here. But that's actually what it looks like in these detectors. Okay, so here's now we did the same thing we did before the thermals, we did it with, with scintillator. Um, I'm getting tired too, as, as you are, so I'll just show you. But it does work, and it turns out, like I said, if you look here at, the, at that red, which is the random prediction, it's falling very rapidly. There's almost no random correlations in this data. So any amount of correlation at all is really, is really good. 
Um, it turns out this is California. Um, the time constant we got here, the original time constant we were using the thermals, uh, the time constant tends to be about 40 nanoseconds or so. 40 to 50 nanoseconds, I mean uh, microseconds. Um, this time of closure is 7.6 nanoseconds. And that's, like I said, it's a time of flight from where we measure where that was happening to the, to the detectors of those fast This is This is now um, plutonium ball that's multiplying. Um, it has a lot more correlation, as you can see. Um, and the other interesting thing is that the time constant's longer. It turns out the correlation time is longer, that's because it's multiplying. And so there's more transit time. The neutron's bouncing around a little bit, causing fissions, but still doing it kind of fast. Um, it turns out, which I, uh, which I don't think I didn't think I showed you here, we can put a moderator around it, and then there's more correlation even, and that's how it happens on a much longer time scale. And it actually decouples. The only thing we see at the short time scale is the immediate fast flexion. So that multiplication that we see there is due only to the metal that's there. Which again is another feature that's very important if we're looking at an unknown object and we're wondering how much is the material, how much of it's reflected into it, or how much is caused by even the modeling going into it. So we can actually separate those things out and do this now. Um, the interesting thing here is that we surrounded that big guy, and so we actually had a pretty high, this is 5.5% efficient here, which is actually really good. We can do a whole bunch of things with this. Um, there's a, another trick that we, we do, um, which is we can actually use this trick to image. We can actually look, we look for the case, we see a couple of neutrons and a gamma ray preceding it, then we know it's a fission, and we just project the time of the gamma ray along that line, and assume the gamma ray got there instantly. That time is roughly the related to the time, which is the uh, uh, time of flight of the neutrons, we know the energy of the neutron, roughly. But we just project that, and we see well, where the event comes from, and we just image it. And so this is a California interest of five minutes of data, um, and we make a little image of that. Source. And the reason why it's not a point source like it ought to be is because we don't know the true energy. We're just seeing the recoil energy. This is plutonium. Um, so that actually took five minutes. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a gamma ray camera work. You can image of the gamma ray camera, but you need a lot more time than this. This, this plutonium image here was done in 10 seconds with the data. Um, and uh, we can actually do multiple sources too if you want to count more heads or something like that. So, and the, and the, and the distortion, so the, the reason why it's, it's smeared out is because. Um, Again, there's this, the source is extended, um, but it also because um, we're, we're, it's not clear that we're seeing them always from the same thing. We might skip one. Two. Is there any, sh any shielding here? Or no? This here, um, yes, there was shielding here. There was shielding there. The California didn't have any shielding. But, uh, this guy did. Um, it turns out we can do this barrel a little bit here, but it's hard. Um, we don't get, it's not this efficient. We need to shield it in order uh, to get the business if you want. But that's a, that's, a really, that's a really important point, is that the gamma rays in this method tend to screw you eventually. And so you, you, know, you actually care about, about that. Um, it depends what you're measuring exactly. But um, the other thing is, of course, if you're measuring like we do, and we're, we're time tagging our real event, these, there's a, a humongous amount of data that comes out of here. Um, we, we'll, we'll, we'll take 100 gigabytes worth of data in an hour. And so it's, it's a, it becomes a processing problem if you really want to do this well. So right now we're just taking data. So we've actually taken terabytes worth of data that you know hard, hard for us to analyze. Okay, so we're getting down here to the end of this. Um, so this the point I was going to make here was that um, that short time scale though, you know, well counter. So the limit of the well counter is that it opens up the bin. The bin that they actually use in well counters typically is like 30 microseconds or something, and um, it falls apart when the random counts in that 40 microseconds are roughly the same as as what you're trying to measure. And that count rate, oh, and of course, it, it depends what the new bar is, of course, uh, for how significant it is. In Californium, um, that crossover point happens somewhere a few times to the sixth. But in plutonium, that crossover point happens around a little less than 10 to the fifth. So a kilogram of plutonium, uh, weapons grade plutonium, um, turns out a 5% um, fast detector will, will be more efficient. That it will work better, it will give you a better air bar than a 50% efficient ball. If you can make that work. I'm not sure, I'm sorry, but I know how to make that work yet, but it's, it's actually true. So if, in, the, in, the, in this day and age, and like, so I was thinking about this with, um, if people were, we need to account um, MOX material, if you had a lot of fuel rods with, with MOX material, then you would have many tens of kilograms of material in, a, in rods that you want to measure at once. And that flux, the long counter couldn't handle it, or something like a long counter couldn't handle the flux. So you'd have to do, you'd have to go for it if you were on to account for it. 
So anyway, that's kind of you know that's that's the, the short of it. So right now, you know, we we think we're just getting started. We have a lot of other things. Things that I didn't show you that were complicated. The thing that we're interested in now is actually looking at multiple correlations. So we're interested in looking at um, when we see correlations in gamma rays, what happens with the with, with, um, with the neutrons, what happens with the gamma rays with the neutrons. Um, the simple thing is, like I said, is because if you imagine that. Um, you look at California, and you want to plug California for plutonium. Like I said, the, it's the, 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 the neutron distribution looks similar. If you have a low efficiency detector, it's a thermal detector. But if you look fast, not so similar. But if you're looking at them, you want to make them apart. You want to have a really fast way of doing this. You want to have someone using California to simulate plutonium in an arms control problem. Um, you would just you think all I have to do is look for um, a couple of neutrons, look for the gamma rays, because in California, the gamma rays will always perceive the neutrons, because there's no, there's no induced fission. There's no fission changes, only individual fissions going on. Gamma rays move faster, but the ductus faster than the neutrons. So I have plots like that. Turns out they're not so clean. And part of the reason is because we're using PSD. And so sometimes the question is, well, what do you call a neutron and what do you call a gamma ray? That's a lot of the way we're based doing it. We, we actually originally plotted thinking, oh, there's neutrons and not neutrons, really. But a lot of our not neutrons, which we thought were gamma rays, were really neutrons that we misidentified as gamma rays. And so they were limited. But it turns out there's other ways to do it. But right now, one of the things that I'm really worried about, I'm thinking about a lot, is how do we, how do we, uh, if we're using detection of PSD, how to keep the PSD functioning well, um, no matter what the source is. And again, California is a bad example because California doesn't have a lot of gamma rays pretty neutron. And so California is always easy to measure, as it turns out. A real plutonium is hard, and feels great plutonium is harder. So there's a lot more gamma rays pretty neutron. There's a lot more contaminants and crap in there. So anyway, these are kind of things that we're, that we're doing. Um, if, you know, if, you, if you do this work, you get to, you get to play with all kinds of stuff. Um, in the past, you got to travel and talk to all kinds of countries about their stuff, you know, which is fun. Um, I've been to Russia a bunch of times. I'm wondering if I'm ever going to go again, given the political situation, because it doesn't seem like it's something that the government wants us to do anymore. Um, but you know, there's, there's interesting problems here. Um, one of the reasons I get away came is I'm hoping that you know some people are interested in this and and because uh, we we have um, we can we have students before we'd like to host students to come work with us. Um, we can guarantee that there's interesting correlations. <coughs> there's certainly angular correlations that we there's, there's all kinds of details in here that have not been worked out. Um, it turns out even the, even the nuclear data doesn't have, so we're interested in measuring the um, the numbers and the distribution we predict are dependent of course on how many we see. As I told you, we have the threshold detector. So the, the average distributions of, of, of neutron to fission are, are known reasonably well. The average energy is known well. Um, what's not known is the number versus correlation. So could you imagine if you have more neutrons, they probably have less energy than average if there's fewer. But people don't have that just to work out yet. Well, um, there's, there's also, um, you know, there's known angular correlations, but I think a lot of people have done those correlations for long as it turns out. Um, reasons to believe it might this. But anyway, um, um, there are these correlations though between the fragments um, themselves because people you know, can imagine that the fragments are moving off to each other to give off neutrons. They are some absolute correlations. Sure that they're washed out a lot. But there is along the line versus perpendicular line. But you don't really know that. Um, the measure, the measure. But anyway, so there's a lot of things that, that you know can be done here and we're still going strong here. Um, when we run out of funding, it's probably going to retire us. You know, that'll be a good good monitor for you. Um, so, um, but I'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Uh, questions of you know, it's like a little bit more like that. Great. But thank you. Thank you. Yeah, do you have to get a note from your mom to play with uh, moderator and two kilogram balls of plutonium? I mean, is there is there an analysis or review for criticality? For all the, it's, if we could reflect two kilograms of plutonium uh, into, as I always tell the critical. So the truth is, yes, that's a question. Um, okay, so so I, partly since I think I became a physicist because my father was an engineer working at LBL. He used to always tell me that he hated it because the physicists always told him what to do, you know, and he just didn't stand that. So I'm the kind of person who's likely told what to do, so I thought I was a physicist. Well, now the safety and security people tell us what to do. So they, these all have to go through some kind of. They do, use. and it's actually a, a very, a very tricky thing um, in itself. But um, yes, um, we, we we have to um, um, prove that what we do is. But that's these are not multiplying very 
much. They don't get too excited until the payment is up around 10. Uh, but even that, it's a long ways from there to going to the And these are all contained objects. That's also the key. Um, you know, we, we, we see objects that we measure in our labs, or they're not. We, I used to actually have a lab in our super block right now to go do this. Um, but it's gone now. I don't I have to go to other places where we send the material. Um, but um, those objects are typically, you know, they're, they're not bare material that could be uh, put in water and go for So they have to be reflected in the material. And so, uh, but you know, it's, it's a constant argument for us to, to, to get some material. But we can do it. Um, it. It's pretty hard to go much over 10, though. It tends to make people very excited. Um, it took a while before, actually. I, I, it took me years to convince our head to be all guys that we could use measures that are up to 10. Well, is 10 representative of anything that's out there in, in an arms control with verification? Uh, arms control, no. Arms control, typically not, no. Um, most most um, uh, state kind of things these days are, are, are they're tend, tend to be shells, of course. Um, ball things are, are um, so, but it could be, I mean, it, 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 so we don't know how to extend arms control uh, uh, treaties even to, you know, to our, to our friends or, or our, our opponents. Um, someday, maybe they'll do it to emerging countries, in which case some of the designs may, of course, be much more highly multiplied. But, uh, um, but, you know, Trinity, for example, you know, Trinity was, was huge in multiplied. Right? I, mean, that, 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 I think it's stationary was uh, like uh, one case over 50. It was 0.98 or something like that, can't think. Just, you know, because it, uh, it was, you know, like six kilograms of plutonium, totally refle you know, reflected stuff is right on top of it. Um, so, there are, there are plenty of designs that multiply a lot. Um, they're, they're, we don't use them. Most countries don't use it because they're, they're tending to be a waste of material. It's not, it's not the efficient way to do it. <laughs> so. yes. Quick question uh, regarding the um, angular correlations among different particles mm -hmm. and whatnot. I know that um, Sarah Pozzi at University mm -hmm. of Michigan has been doing a lot with yes. that and uh, MCMP, Polini, the whole bit. You guys talk with them at all? And with them? We, 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 have, we have talked with them. Um, so one of the things that, so we've seen the results. We have other results that don't match theirs exactly. Um, and we partly, be, partly we haven't put out, so we've intended to publish some of the stuff that we do, but we haven't published them because partly because, like I said, these are hugely dependent upon understanding your, your actual efficiency of your detectors properly. And, and uh, I, that's my problem, is I don't believe that most people figured out their detectors properly, it, and which is why I think that they see correlations um, stronger than they, I believe they exist. Um, there's models for them, actually Livermore has models that are being made right now, Rick knows about this too, that are being made that are, are simple kinematic models, but they, they predict mo much milder um, correlations than people had said that they had seen. And uh, like, so I, 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 I tend to have doubted most people's, but also because they tended to do it with very few cells, and they did not work out their systematic um, you know, measurement problems. So we have a lot of cells. And so we're actually protected or cements. We can look at correlations between any of them and, and, and see which, you know, any pairs of them to see how they match. And that's why, so we don't see the correlation strongly as people say they've done it. As I recall, part of the concern was scattering from one cell. That's right. right. There's, that's a huge problem. Making multiple scattering, multiple the scattering between. So, the so if you put your cells up close and just, just move them around, right. most, of your scatter, most of what you're seeing is scattering. And you actually tend to see a high amount. You have to, under, you have to understand your pile of problems too very well. But like I said, I know a lot of people don't do it because I can see that they're, in Sarah's group, this is not true. But I've seen in other people's data where I can tell that their data was wrong because their, 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 their stated correlation, um, you know, efficiency versus the counts they were seeing did match up right now. Especially between, especially their, their singles rate versus their correlated rate, they'd have a much higher, you know, their correlation rate they might have been, a, you know, a quarter of their singles rate, right? And their efficiency was like a percent. Or something, and you go like, that's not possible, right? So they don't, again, the only way you know it is by actually knowing what you expect to see and being able to see whether that number is right or not. Right. What Les was referring to is a theory effort by Ramon and Bogue and Yuri and yes. I'll be all developing what these correlations should look like. They that's right. They have, they have a model. So it's, you know, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reasonable model to check against, and you, I mean, you can also check it if you get better data. Right now, the, the data that we get, we're not, we're not so sure about it. So we can we can do um, average correlations to get numbers off of an object that we want to go break down to see what you know, we, we have to understand systematics. Again, even that you have to match the detectors, even all the cells with each other, so not easy to do. They're all slightly different the way that they're made. So. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if you're 
Other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Les again.